Hello and welcome to Saturday Night Shaggy. Uh, this is the April episode, and with me today I have my lovely co-hosts, Sakaki and Beelord. Say what's up. What's up? Sun. Hello, humans. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, well, anyway, uh, Saturday Night Shaggy is a podcast dedicated towards uh, bringing everyone. The goodness that is Shogaku Khan manga. Um, we usually cover English news. Uh, there's not that much, really, besides uh, releases that came out this month. Uh, we also have Japanese news, which we will go into right after. And t- for today's uh, main topic, we're actually going to talk about our first of hopefully many uh, Kazuhiro Fujita manga, uh, Jagan Wagachiri Nitobu. The Wicked Eye Flies to the Full, the full Moon, which is uh, pretty insane. Truly. As Fujita does. But, uh... All hail our King Fujita. <laughs> yes, all hail. Um, I guess, uh, Velor, do you want to go into what came out this month uh, for English releases? Yeah, so we have, in April, three brand new series... And the first of them is the one that we have already talked about on our previous episode, because we got early from Viz. Jeez, I wonder what it was. It doesn't seem that important. Oh, it was just Call of the Night by Kotoyama. Yeah. I mean, if you've listened to our previous episode, you already know our thoughts on it. Um, It's really good. Super awesome story. Very stylish. Oh, yes. Yeah, super stylish. And just if you're wondering, it ran in Weekly Show on the Sunday, and it's currently still in Weekly Show on the Sunday. And the official release date was April 13th. So if you haven't picked it up already, go pick it up because it's amazing and awesome. What are you doing? Go buy it. Stop this <laughs> podcast and go buy it. <laughs> buy it, read it, and then listen to our episode. Exactly. That's That's the right way to do it. Yes, exactly. But the other two titles that are debuting this month actually come from Seven Seas. And the first of which is one that I think is close to Marion's heart. And that is Die Dark by Q Hayashida. I need this. I need this so badly. (laughs) Yes. For people that aren't... For people that aren't familiar with Q Hayashida, they previously did Doro Hidoro, which got a anime like last year and was released in its entirety by Viz. So it's kind of a bit of a surprise that Viz picked or not Viz. It's kind of a bit of a surprise that Seven Seas of all people picked it up. But hey, it works. It currently runs in Japan in Gasan. Get the sun. And <laughs> 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 yes and it's coming out april 20th so go pick that up and the other thing seven seas is publishing that's shaggy is super sentai himitsu sentai go ranger the classic manga collection this is a manga by the shotaro ishinomori who people will probably be familiar for Because they are the creator of Cyborg 009, as well as Common Rider. (laughs) (laughs) But yes, I mean, Yoshinomori has a very long history in manga there, kind of one of the big greats. And this was a series that actually ran in Weekly Show Sunday, so it's pretty old. It was from 1975, so kind of... A boomer manga, but <laughs> oh <my laughs> but the little I've seen of it looks amazing, and you should definitely go pick it up when it comes out on April twenty seventh. Nice. Yeah, don't give uh, Seven Seas a reason to 
cancel their whole classic collection line, please. Thank you. I'm really happy that they're continuing the classic manga collection line. Even though we already uh, know we had heard bomb hard. Yeah, outside of Devilman. Devilman apparently did quite well. Uh, probably because of the Netflix anime that came out. So props to that. But apparently the other ones did not really meet expectations. In fact, the modern interpretations of some of those series actually did better than the classic manga collections, <laughs> which is uh, sad. kind also, of both surprising and depressing. Yeah, it's sad, but also happy, but also, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So go pick up this. Go pick up Super Sentai, not only to support classic manga and Shaggy, but just like manga in general. Get, go give Seven C some love, too. They do awesome stuff. Yeah. But there's also quite a few other Shaggy titles coming out in April. So we're going to go down the list. On April 13th, we have Case Closed, Volume 78, Comey Can't Communicate, Volume 12, Pokemon Adventures, Black 2 and White 2, Volume 3, which is a very long awaited release, mind you, because like. Black 2 and White 2 was on a notoriously long hiatus. Um, so that's a very big win for Pokemon Adventures fans. Just to put that in there. I did not then know that. Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle, Volume 14. Pokemon Adventures Collector's Edition, Volume 7. Splatoon Squid Kids Comedy Show, Volume 3. And How Heavy Are the Dumbbells You Lift, Volume 6. Then on April 20th, we have Asadora Volume 2, Ultraman Volume 15, Blue Giant Omnibus Volumes 3 and 4, Cirque du Freak the Manga Volume 2, and Golden Japan Esque A Splendid Yokohama Romance Volume 2. And finally, we have the digital only releases that are all dropping on April 27th, which are Renee Volumes 27 and 28, and Hayate the Combat Butler Volumes 29 and 30. So a pretty packed uh, release schedule for April, I'd say, and quite a few awesome releases, even beyond the new series. Mm Mm-hmm. Sounds like we got a lot to read. Indeed. I have a uh, growing pile of books to get through, and these are just going to add to them. Oh, V Lord, you did this to yourself. I mean, there's really no one else to blame here. <laughs> I mean, I did. I, I, I can't <laughs> blame anyone else for that. But hey, it's worth it. They're all really good. Yeah, I honestly, fair. I was kind of, I was kind of waiting for, uh, or kind of hoping Die Dark would be licensed a little later because, as it is. I don't think there's that many volumes out. Uh, there are three. Uh, well, yeah. three I'm not sure is out yet, but I know th- I did see the cover for three floating around on Japanese sites. So, yeah, and the thing about uh, licenses is that like the fact that once they catch up uh, to releases, they're gonna have to license every subsequent volume separately, and that might take way longer as opposed to just like having like maybe five plus or six plus volumes, and then you could maybe put those out like every two months instead. Uh, yeah, that's true. And I, I don't uh, think Seven Seas is known for simul pubs either, so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've done a pretty decent job with most of the series that they've caught up with, though, that are ongoing, so... I'm not too concerned about it, but it's definitely going to be quite a bit of wait in between volumes, I feel. Once, like, we're fully caught up. Yeah, I just don't want it to be, uh... Um, a remonster scenario. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, otherwise, pretty good crop this month. Uh, I think I'm gonna wait for a couple. Um, I'm gonna wait for a couple more volumes of uh, Blue Giant. I don't know how many total that is, but I, I really want like a good day to just read all of it once it's out. Yeah. The first series of Blue Giant is, I believe, 10 volumes. Okay, good. We got like, we got like yeah. three more omnibuses. 
Yeah, I mean, of course, then there's Blue Giant Supreme, which is 11. So hopefully this does well enough that Seven Seas picks up more Blue Giant. So I'm going to ask a silly question here, but what is Blue Giant about? Jazz. Okay. Yeah. That title does. It's about a uh, high school student who heart whose heart is touched by jazz, and uh, plays the saxophone, which is really cool. Okay, uh, I feel I feel bad because I know Vlords mentioned this a few times, but there's so many manga with the, with the name Blue Blank <laughs> <laughs> that it's hard to keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I haven't uh, read the entirety of the first Omnibus Blue, of Blue Giant, but the art is like amazing, and the story seems pretty compelling. Plus, I am a saxophone player. I played the saxophone for, God, over 10 years at this point, which is weird to think about, but Damn. it's definitely a topic that I can relate to, so it's cool to see it in manga form. Nice. Well, was then... it tenor sax, I think we had the conversation. What kind of sax? Is it tenor? Like in the manga? No, 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 you're... Oh, so I play the alto and the uh, baritone sax. Oh, okay, cool. I was tenor, so we're not stepping on each other's toes. Good. I mean, we just need to have a corner on this show where it's sax with Mary <laughs> and V-Lord, or V-Lord and Mary and sax on the beach. You know, something like that. <laughs> I mean, I literally have my saxophone. <laughs> I literally have my saxophone like right next to me, so we could do that one at night. <laughs> cool. I don't want you to wake. I don't want you to fuck up your neighbor's evening. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh yeah, they they would probably get pissed. <laughs> okay, clearly I'm the one with the house, so we can just all have a jam session here one day. Nice. <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> okay, um, I guess we're moving to we're moving out of this um western. No wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, okay. Yo. Now we can move on to the Japanese news. Sakaki, take it over. God. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just that take away my out transition. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Like I, I thought this was a... Anyway. Um, yes, yes. I'm your Japanese correspondent, Sakaki, here. And I've got a lot to talk about. Like, it's been a crazy just week. So, in Weekly Sunday, um, we've got a few series ending. Uh, surprisingly, Atsushi Namikiri Switch is ending in three chapters, which it should be issue 23 if there are no breaks or anything like that. Um, this comes as a surprise because, well, Shogakuka was pretty big at announcing that Switch is getting more sales. It's going, you know, it's they were doing promotions with like sports teams and they were doing a whole lot to promote this series and it was working. Like every couple of issues, they'd announce, oh, it went up another, you know, 100. Uh, it's what is it now? I think, like, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but like, I think it's now at like 700k copies in print, something like that. So, which isn't bad for, I mean, a Sunday series by a uh, new artist. So it's weird to see it's ending. I mean, a few of the people I talk to in Sunday circles are assuming maybe this is the end of part one. But the most recent chapter that was in issue um, 20, it really feels like it's just ending, ending. So with all of this going on, it, it it's... I don't want to, you know, of course, we don't know what's going on in the background. We don't know if it's Nami Kiri. It's just like, I can't do this anymore or what's going on. Because it was oddly at the bottom of the magazine like every week. And what I've heard is when magazine, when, um, a, so in the table of contents, when a series often appears at the bottom, that's usually because they're getting the manuscript script late. That's one of the reasons. Obviously, the other reason is that the series is just not performing well. So, I mean, I hate to bring Jump into our lovely home, but we had something similar with another series in Jump, Phantom Seer, that also ended at the end of the bottom at the bottom of the magazine, despite it. Oh, you hear that? Well, All what? the Phantom Seer fans heard you talking shit. <laughs> I'm not talking shit, dude. I'm saying the truth. You said it was that. <laughs> Okay, fair. It was Axe, though. I mean, you guys can <laughs> deny it all you want, but <laughs> anyway, yeah, so Switch is ending in uh, 
you know, should be gone by issue 23. And I guess by then you can pay attention to the WSS talk back on Twitter and see if it really is just the end of part one or if it's the end of the series, period. Um, besides that, speaking of issue 20, um, Makoto Hoshino's um, Night of the Outcast ended. Now, this one was pretty much, yeah, that one was, it was forecasted for a while. It wasn't selling too well. I mean, Sunday, again, was doing a whole lot of work to promote it, and that didn't seem to matter. And it just finished a really big arc. So this seems like a pretty good place to end. And, you know, reading the chapter myself, it it wrapped up most things. It was a pretty cute and fluffy ending. And so there's really no complaints. It also seemed like uh, Hoshino Sensei was like having some medical problems because the series was going on break quite often towards the end of its run. And I do remember reading something on Twitter about Hoshino kind of thanking Shogaku Khan for being so kind to them and allowing them to take more breaks. So maybe this was for the best for them. Um, it did end in issue 20, and they did, and it does indicate that. Hoshino's might be drawing drawing something else for Sunday. Now, for people that don't know, um, generally speaking, at least in Sunday, I can't say for Jump, but um, or magazine, but at the end of the uh, serialization, they might have a little note that okay, the author, please look forward to the author, whatever author's next work. Now, this isn't a tr- uh, anything written in blood that they are definitely going to draw something for su- in Sunday or for in Shogakukan, but. It's a, usually a pretty good indicator that at least they have a they still have a pretty decent relationship with the publisher because I've seen some I've seen some series where it ends and there's no such note, but again and on the opposite of that it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no note that they they hate Sugaku Khan and will never come back. So, but yeah, I do hope to see Hoshino back. Their artwork was really good, and it is a shame that even with all the promotion from from Shogaku Khan that there wasn't it just didn't turn to sales. You can also look forward from the volume one of the series coming from Seven Seas in June, which were. It still surprises me that they licensed it. I just feel like it fills a niche that is fairly popular, which is like, you know, lonely girl and supernatural man coming into her life and they go on adventures and stuff. I feel like there's an audience for that. And they looked at it and like, yeah, we can we can definitely roll with that. I don't really think it was. Yeah. I don't really think it was picked up for like because it was popular. I just feel like it fills that niche. And now it's short. I think volumes. I feel like six and seven. I might be wrong on that, but yeah, I think volumes six and seven both come out the same day, May eighteenth. So it'll huh. be nice and quick for them. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense, especially since Seven Seas isn't like opposed to releasing like shorter series, anyways. Yeah. A lot of like the titles they release aren't like larger than like five volumes, so yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe they had a connection to Shogaku Khan that was like, yeah, we're about to pull the plug on this thing. So it's like, oh well, that that's gonna be easy for us to just throw out there. So sure, why not? We'll cop that. <laughs> um, in other news, well, we were talking about Call of the Night, and Volume Seven is it just recently came out in Japan. And in Volume 7 was a special chapter of Dagashikashi. I kind of made a note on the Twitter that um, once Viz gets to Volume 7 of uh, Call of the Night, it'll be the first time we've got any official Dagashikashi manga in English. I mean, because it's unlikely that they're going to just take this out because nobody knows about that kind of candy shit. So, yeah. (laughs) So, like, I'm. I mean, they say this as I, I say this as I'm eagerly anticipating a candy related manga coming from Jump tomorrow. <laughs> but um, yes, that's the the special chapter ran of Dagashikashi like last year on Sunday. Um, it was pretty short. Just, uh, you know, Dagashikashi chapters are pretty short for all. They're like 11 pages, I feel like. And this was it wasn't really a big deal. Like it was just the characters kind of getting together and, you know, hanging out a bit. And there was a little bit of a reference to call of the night, but other than that, it's just kind of like a fun little chapter for fans of Takashi Kashi who just wanted to see the characters again. It's not really this big extra thing that you have to understand the whole series for. It would help, but yeah, I'm actually more interested in a, uh, chapter that happened at a Takashi Kashi about Hajime, which is included in the Takashi Kashi fan book. 
I did cover it on the blog, and at some point, maybe I should like link it. And it was a really good it, that showed that Kotoyama's more than just a comedy guy, as uh, uh, Call of the Night shows. But yeah, that'll. Mm, yeah, that, I remember you covering that on the Twitter, and it looked really cool. Yeah, it was it was really good, like really really good. Maybe someday we can talk about it. But yeah, so definitely look forward to that when Viz gets to it. Hey, who knows? Maybe if people talk about it enough, they'll go back and get the Gashi Gashi. <laughs> Please don't let us dream hopelessly or something. I don't know. I, I, I'm very doubtful that we're going to get the Gashi Gashi. Uh, the same, but it is what it is. Uh, Sales wise, um, free run is just free running at this point. Like it's outselling. I, I don't know if it was V Lord or someone else that told me this, but and I didn't believe them until I saw these numbers that it's outselling all of the new series from Jump and Magazine. And it is. <laughs> Somebody's getting fucked. Fuck, 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 fuck. Somebody's I mean, getting fucked. <laughs> what the fuck, <laughs> Wait, have you never heard that song? It's on YouTube. Hold on. <laughs> I don't listen to trash. <laughs> oh, burn. Anyway, um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, free run is like for this week, the fourth week of sales from March. Uh, free run sold 19, 19k uh, and with, ended with 220k for total. Well, close to 230. No, 221. Sorry. Um, and Mao sold 3,000 copies, bringing it to 52k total for march and those are the two series that made it through the entire march the entire month of march and yeah like that's pretty representative of the magazine right now aside from of course comey uh call of the night and everything which they'll be out next month along with mr shonen sunday detective conan so i'm already seeing sales for april and yeah conan's dominating but that's not surprising i mean well maybe it is a little bit because i mean it's volume 99 and conan still brings still brings the fans to the yard he may still be a child but he's still raking in the dough exactly speaking of and i don't have this up which is really bad but speaking of um streaming sales it actually has a huge backlog because it was recently featured on japanese talk show ma talk ame talk excuse me um and volume one is on 22 of shows is at Place 22 of Shoseki, Volume 2 is on 24, Volume 4 is on 29, and Volume 3 is on 31. So after being on Ame Talk, which it's kind of just a Japanese variety show, but a lot of manga have really benefited from being featured on there. I don't remember if it was Kingdom that was on there at one point. And it, it was Kingdom. Okay. Kingdom blew up after its Ame Talk like special. Yeah. So, yeah, and like not only and apparently not only just free run, but Tokyo Revengers is also featured on the same episode. So it'll be interesting to see the two of them, how their sales grow. But oh, free, run, free run is just it's still just crushing the competition. I can't wait to see it get an anime at some point, And let's see. Let's see if Shogakukan will get it. It's anime on time. Let's but, see. I'm, I'm thinking 2023, 2024. Yeah, that seems about right. It'll be sooner than Comey. Yeah, Comey's, you're right. Yeah, we're gonna just say it louder. <laughs> <laughs> Comey's not happening, everybody. We're we're saying it here on the show, and if we're wrong, then I'll take responsibility. And the next day, a Comey anime is announced. Good. Don't, don't I, fucking joke about that. <laughs> After the weird news, like no. Uh, um. So you're probably wondering now, well, all these series are ending in Sunday and we haven't had a serialization in... Why am I doing Mickey Mouse voice? I don't know. <laughs> but all these series are ending in Sunday and we have serialization since, well, we bring up Free Run since Free Run back in May last year. So is Sunday going to get any new series? Well, I'm here to tell you yes. Yes. Finally, yes. Um, Starting in issue 22... Um, we will have Kyosuke Tanabe's Bilocators, which was the it was featured in 2017 in a rookie competition. Um, I'm assuming from that from there, and the art's pretty slick. 
and I did br I kind of browse it a bit, and it looks like it's about um, doppelgangers, and it's an action series about like people having doppelgangers and the fallout of that. And it looks pretty stylish and cool. And I'm hoping that Tana Bay since um, 2017 has polished their art style and well, that's something fun to look forward to. That'll be in issue 22. On uh, issue 24, Sei Fukui, who brought us Yuko Sai Tatakaeba, um, will have a new series called Kameari Suki Hi. Um, there's, I don't know what it's about and probably I'll have more information on that in the, in, on WSSTV's Twitter once the issue comes out. Uh, but Yuko Sai Tatakaiba is, the best I could describe it is it's basically Gash Bell, but instead of like, where it's a demon battle royale and, you know, the demons come from another world, uh, contract with humans, fight to see who's going to be the top demon. It's the same kind of prem from premise, but in this case, like the le the demon in this series is contracted to a girl named Yuko who's just not interested in fighting. So it's sort of a slice of life series where she's got this demon and it kind of helps her through like normal things like taking tests and stuff like that. And then she meets other demon contractors and they try to fight her and everything, but they end up becoming her friend instead. Because the one the one little um unique thing about this is like Yuko is actually insanely powerful. Like I remember there was one chapter where she sneezed and like just like her demon's power like destroyed like half of a cliff or whatever. So <laughs> like good. the title translates out to be if Yuko would only fight, which I guess is a pretty good sum up of the series, which is that if she would fight, she could probably destroy everyone, but she refuses to. <laughs> <laughs> so I read a little bit of it, and it was a really cute and like funny series. And I'm glad to see Sei Fukui come back. And last but not least, definitely not least, is Arata Kangatari by Yu Watase, which has been on break, uh, hiatus since 2015. Watase has been on record to say that they are suffering from they were suffering from depression, and it's not as if they've just been kind of sitting around since since then they've actually been releasing arata kangatari remixes which are basically i guess you can think of them as like dlc content to, for volumes which is like they add extra things to the volumes that came out before and you know new new stories better artwork stuff like that so yeah and i mean unfortunately while viz has their original series i they haven't released the remixes i don't know what the schematics would be for that but hopefully at some point they will anyway uh issue 25 will see the return of arata khan gatari but what's interesting about this is uh arata will start with the remasters in issue 25 so from the most recent uh volume i'm i'm not really too familiar with the series so i can't really say why that is or maybe that's just because they want to get people re uh, familiar with the story again and then new chapters will begin in issue 32 so i do recall at some point that there was talk that arata's like on its final arc so it might be just coming back to conclude so like by starting with the remasters does that mean like it's going to be remastered material that hasn't been collected into those remastered volumes yet that's what from from the source that I read it from, it sounds like it's more of a thing where it's already been collected in the volume, but there's specifically and wow, as I'm talking about this, I actually found like a picture. But anyway, um yes. Well, yes, okay, great. Actually really great. I'm glad I checked this. So from the Japanese flyer that I found, it's issue twenty-five will feature remastered chapters from volume thirteen. And then Issue 32 will consider will wow, this actually reads a whole new it will be new work. So it's weird because the Japanese reads as if it's like a new series, but like the flyer is definitely definitely has it advertised as Arata Kangatari. So but anyway, yeah, the remaster the remaster is going to be come from a vol and I actually think that I just covered it the other day where volume 14 of the remaster came out like a couple days ago. 
So why they're going to 13? Oh, no, no. OK, I'm sorry. Yes, volume 13 is the one that came out. So basically, you're going to get a preview of the volume that's already out in the magazine. And I guess that's to just get people reacquainted with the series. Oh, OK, that makes sense. I do wonder, though, like, so since like it has the remastered volumes now, do you think like they're going to still continue releasing the old Tonka Bonds? And continue from that where that left off, or just like have the remasters be the only like way to read it moving forward. I get the idea that they're probably just gonna go forward to remasters. Like, uh, I I couldn't really say because right now they're not really. I mean, the flyer that I found, and I I guess I could kind of see them doing like, yeah, I guess yeah, it's kind of weird because it would be weird for them to just like. Hmm. To think of it one... I mean, it would basically be the decay route. <laughs> True. But to think of it this way, there's obviously got to be a lot of stock built up of these things. Because, I mean, clearly, uh, Watase has probably been drawing this at least on and off for the last couple of years. So I wouldn't be surprised if, like, they just continued to remasters because the art... Watase has had a lot of time to kind of perfect it. But, yeah, I, I at this point, I don't know. But now I can actually talk about the series a little bit more <laughs> because now I've seen this. Now I've got this flyer going on. Um, uh, read that to see. Anyway, it's the first one Hi, uh, by, by Locators. It says that it's like a battle action series. Um, anyway, yeah, and it's about, yeah, it's a battle action series. The one by, say, Fukui sounds like it's about a girl, a girl that wants to become a comedian so yeah about two girls who want to be a comedian and then um arata kanagatari so definitely that's i'm looking forward to this and that sounds like a very sunday set of series to get like comedians <laughs> of all things so um oh yeah and then there's conan now i will preface this by saying these are just estimates like I found a pretty uh, zealous Conan fan who's been keeping track of the movie performance, but um, at the end of day two, it's made seven hundred and sixty million yen, with the current cumulative total of one point three six billion yen. And this is for the Scarlet Bullet that just opened in theaters well two days ago. It's likely to surpass two billion yen tomorrow, so Conan still there very much got it. And it's right now number one in Japanese theaters, but again, it just dropped with Ava taking, I believe, two. Yeah. So Conan is doing pretty well for itself. And last but not least, this isn't really news, but I figured we should talk about it a little bit, seeing that V Lord, Marion, and I did speak about this yesterday, ironically. <laughs> but today in 2002, uh, Sun Matsuena started uh, Kenichi Saikyo no Deshi Kenichi ran from April 17, 2002 to September 17, 2014. So this is marks the anniversary of it beginning in Sunday, which was one of Sunday's longest series. Well, longer series, I should say. Um, what I've heard is that there's a little bit of bad blood. Not bad blood, because clearly Matsuena's drawing the Amazing Kimiwa double zero zero eight right now on Sunday. <laughs> you mean the masterpiece? <laughs> yes, the masterpiece. <laughs> but yes, um, apparently, um, S S Matsuena mentioned at the end of like Kenichi's final volume that he actually had more he wanted to do with it, but he was told to end the series by Shogakukan. Um, and he started another series, Tokiwa Kitairi. Kita, just gonna call it Tokiwa. He started the series after that, which was really interesting because it started off with four one shots about that seemed to be completely unrelated until the last one shot where it revealed that they were all in the same universe. And then he started the series, Tokiwa. And that went for a couple, of, that went, I want to say, for 15 volumes and then was canceled. So Matsuena was kind of a little bit annoyed that they told him to wrap up Kenichi. I'd assume probably Shogakukan was like, you could do better than this. And it's not selling as well anymore. So, yeah. Um, but he's still with Shogakukan. So I guess whatever problem they had with, you know, whatever problems he had with them wasn't enough for him to go seek out Kadansha. <laughs> 
So the free roaming pastures of Kodansha where he could sexualize his female characters even more. <laughs> like you can look at like this like a uh, debut issue of Sunday with uh Kenichi and look the final volume cover. And you can see like just how Prominent more gratuitous his Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the, okay, for one thing, the nipples are somehow larger, like, significantly larger for some reason. But also, just, like, he's definitely made his artwork a lot more gratuitous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, almost like the only era came. No. <laughs> and he got obsessed with skin-tight clothing. For some reason. I mean, more so, because looking at the first volume of Kenichi, it wasn't like, you know, they were wearing baggy clothing then, and just over the years, they got smaller and smaller, but... Yeah, he just got rid of the bras. Yeah, yeah essentially. <laughs> because apparently no one wears a bra in Matsue this week. It, it's really a shame, because, like, when he's not horny, which is, again, 80% of the time, his artwork's actually pretty good. Because I've I've read some I'm obviously I'm reading all of Sunday, so I see Kimiwa 008. Not to mention, it's weird. Lately, I want to say for probably this entire year, it's had more than 20 pages every week. Which with Sunday's dwindling series, I guess makes sense. <laughs> Maybe they're just like we can somebody's got to fill in these pages. And it's not gonna be um it's not going to be Sleepy Princess, which is like 11 pages per 11 to 14 pages per chapter. So here, we'll just give Matsuena a bunch of extra pages. At first, they used to advertise them like extra pages, you know, enjoy the series or whatever. But now they just stopped because it's just a normal part of the magazine. It's like, you know what you're getting. So, now. yeah, it's 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 interesting. But yeah, that's everything from the other side of the pond. Also, I'm going to say this now on podcast, but if Anyone ever licenses Kimiwa 008? We are definitely gonna cover it. I'm going. No, I'm already, and I'm gonna say on podcast too. That week, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> I'm gonna fit into the trash can, but I'll still do it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be in the trash can. Good. <laughs> Seven Cs. It'd be the perfect title for your ghost ship line. God. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm right. You're not, you're you not know wrong I'm at all. Right. You're not. No. If we denied it, we'd be just fools. And now let's transition into our main topic: Kazuhiro Fujita, Jaganwa Gashirin Itoku. The wicked eyes, or the wicked eye flies to the full moon. That's a handful of a title. Mouthful. So, yes. um, uh. First things first, this does not have an English release. We uh, basically bought it on Bookwalker and like read through it. I I personally I skimmed through it because I did not have the uh, the focus to like actually uh, you know there's no there's no furry, so I couldn't bother to like go through every word and like look it up. So I got the gist of what was going on because to be honest, uh, when it comes to Fujita, he kind of has like a similar motif that goes on in a lot of his stories where it's like, oh, an ancient, uncontrollable evil uh, has to be defeated by uh, a, a group of people who probably don't get along too well at first, but, you know, when adversity strikes, that's what happens, right? So. Yeah, I mean, like, Fujita's work isn't like super complex at times. Especially this series, like, it's fairly straightforward. Like, the general premise is that there's this mysterious owl codenamed Minerva, and Minerva has this power that whenever its eyes look at someone, it instantly kills them. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were joking about it before recording, but this is basically like Ushio and Tora for adults. Like, and even it's yeah. not really even for adults, I should say. Because like reading through it, it's like the violence level and all of the stuff that's in it, you pretty much get the same thing as Ushio and Tora. 
kind of reminds me of a prototype Sobote. Or that it definitely does come off that way because his artwork is closer to Sobote than Ushio and Tora. The story just re- yeah. very much reminded me of like basically the final arc. Yeah, and this was uh this was serialized in what a uh, big big comic? Yes, big comic. Big comic spirits. It was serialized during the time frame between when Car Curry Circus ended and before Moonlight Act started. I see. Okay, so yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it released in twenty seventeen. I see. Wow. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Oh, it was digital in twenty seventeen. Yeah, I was supposed to say oh. like I'm stupid. <laughs> Yeah, I was supposed to say, wow, that, yeah. that's... <laughs> anyway, yes. Uh, I actually read... I did actually read through this. I read, I skimmed it once, and then read through it again. And yeah, it helps that uh, Fujita's work is pretty straightforward. Even without Furry, I was more or less able to get, like, you know, the intricacies of the story and everything. But was what was most interesting was, like, actually the end of it, where Fujita kind of talked about how the story came together. I mean, he first of all, he like apologized to Owls. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he's like, I, I didn't mean to make you guys come off as creepy and everything like that, but it just and that year, oh. Owl violence went up a whopping three hundred percent. I was definitely curious about like his comments at the end because I saw them, but I was like, "There's no Furigana," and I already put through all the effort of reading the actual thing, so I'm just gonna give up here and go cry in the corner. Yeah, he was he was just sort of talking about owls are cute creatures, and I am kind of sorry that I made like this series that makes them terrifying. <laughs> um, what else did he say? I mean, the more the more interesting things was just like you know he's used to drawing super long manga, so it's like it was like kind of a dream that he was able to get everything he wanted into one volume, <laughs> and even then, like he wanted to do five chapters. But the fifth chapter was like 70 pages. I'm reading the like Omake. Like he's talking to his editor and it's like Christmas. Yeah, Christmas Eve. Like he's his and his editor meeting at a family restaurant. And he was just like, the editor's like, yeah, you know, five chapters is great. But factor five, 70 pages. So how about we reduce it to 40? Like we just freaking out. You want me to cut 30 pages? And like they're just both laughing and then like, OK, fine. And you got to give you got to have two more chapters. And then like. They're both laughing and like crying at the same time. <laughs> so <laughs> that also explains why chapter five was like weirdly longer than the others. Yeah, yeah, that that was like it was his intention to only have five years, but that was happened. And then Yeah. I mean it's funny that like he talks about like how he was able to like essentially shove the ideas of a full series into this one volume. Cause that's literally what he did. Cause like as Marion kind of joked, it's like one of the common, like, kind of motifs of Fujita is overcoming, like, uh, a giant obstacle with the help of fragmented groups or people. And that's essentially what happens, because, like, you have, like, the military getting involved, different factions. Um, you have this uh, mysterious, like, uh, sharpshooter Yuhei from, like, the countryside joining in. And they all have to, like, work together to take down this super powerful owl despite all the bickering and differences in culture and perspectives that they have yeah you can't convince me that's not japanese uso <laughs> what <laughs> you know what i don't want to talk to you <laughs> i mean lots of fuchida characters have long noses though hey, he reminded so. me of the one like puppet from karakuri circus and i know that's really descriptive but <laughs> like yeah, no, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. I think most people know that one if they've seen Car Curry Circus yeah. or read it. So, like, um, yeah, you know, the... Uh, God, I already forgot his name. Yuhei, like, um, and he has his adoptive daughter, Rin. And, like, basically, she's kind of upset that, like, the owl killed their, her adoptive mom, whose name I'm, I'm escaping me right now. But, like, she was killed, so Rin is like, I don't see that guy father or whatever and i mean it's really funny because like the military there's a guy named keith and mike i think and they it's kevin and kevin, mike, kevin and mike thank you like and like they come and you hey's like no i'm not gonna go and then you know they talk to rin too and like rin's um receptive to the idea that okay we have to stop this thing but yeah you hey's like no nah, and then they she basically comes in and he like like says get your ass up dad we're gonna do this he's like okay 
<laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> and like um um Mike and um Kevin are just like, what? That that's it? Because like he's giving he's giving Mike and Kevin a bunch of shit and they're not listening to them. All it takes is his daughter to yell at him once and he just goes. Um and also, let me just, uh, I, I said this to V-Lord the other day, but, like, Fujisa just makes, like, middle-aged old men look really hot for no reason. Because, like, when Mike and, like, Kevin get off the helicopter, like, that is the most badass thing I've ever seen is, uh, they're not even, like... It is. <laughs> no, go ahead, V-Lord. <laughs> no, I was going to say, like, yeah, they are. And I joked with uh, Sakaki yesterday that Mike kind of looks like Lieutenant Surge from Pokemon. Yes, he does. <laughs> He does. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially that is how it goes. And so they go, um, Yuhei and Rin go to America with them to, you know, stop this owl and everything like that. And in the meantime, I think it's still in Tokyo, actually. Huh? The owl is still in Tokyo. Oh, so it's still in Tokyo. I was Because it murdered everyone in Tokyo and made it a wasteland. <laughs> I was confused by that for a second, I admit, but okay, great. That that's great to have that clarification. And also I the mom's name is Chieko. I just found that. I actually took a bunch of pictures of what things I want to talk about. Um, but I'm not gonna really cover all of them. But yeah, they go and in the meantime, Rin and you know uh Yuhei kind of like reconcile a bit and I mean it is kind of nice that um she at first she's just calling him by his name and refuses to call him dad but then as, after the reconcile they do she does start calling him dad and everything like that so i mean as usual fujita's art is just that top form like the layouts are incredible yeah especially like the final battle where like you have Kevin and Yuhei on, like, the fighter jet. And, like, they're literally clashing with Minerva in the sky. Because, like, they're going straight down, like, from the sky. Because, like, that'd be, like, the easiest blind spot to fight Minerva. And Minerva's going up, like, towards the fighter jet. And the whole, like, thing with Minerva is that, like, his power, like... Its power is essentially its eyes are shooting out this like invisible poison. And because like gravity is no longer pushing the poison down, it's shooting it up like a weird wave of like acid. Yeah, essentially. It looks so cool. Yeah, that that that's I mean they yeah, that that's essentially it. And um, oh yeah, kind of like, and I love that at the end of this, the, at the end of the um, the manga when they finally they kind of explain like Rin explains what she, she knows what the owl was thinking, you know, when they finally are able to shoot it, and it was like the eyes of the 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 like engine of the jet like barreling down at the owl, uh, Minerva, and like its last thoughts were like, I'm so scared. Yeah, like God, oh, yeah. that, that like that panel, panel too. Like, oh, yo. <laughs> <laughs> that panel too, like looked so good. It's, it it, it kind of that's what kind of reminded me of like um, Ushio and Tora too, which is like uh, that the Hakumen no Mono was always looking like up and. It was because it's like afraid of everything. I don't. I don't think that was the like specific reason, but it's like no. It kind of like it was jealous of everybody else, and it was like looking down because like I like I just love that moment when Tora is kind of pointing out like yeah, you know, normally when you think you're superior to somebody, you know, no, looking up. I'm sorry. Yeah, looking up. Okay, but yeah, normally when you think you're superior to somebody, you look down upon them. But Hakuman is always looking up because it's like jealous of everybody. And, I, and, I, and that was what the whole thing with Minerva kind of reminded me of. Like, yeah, like Fujita's always got that kind of like really interesting, like, I don't know, he, the way he does villains is like they are somewhat sympathetic, but they still get their comeuppance at the end, which is kind of it, it really is kind of like um, satisfying. 
Yeah, I also love how even with Minerva, who's basically an owl, like, it doesn't really talk, he still lets it be smug <laughs> at one <Yes>. point. Because, <laughs> like, at one point they hire, like, a bunch of snipers to try to kill Minerva, and it can sense all their blood loss, so it's just like, hey, I can take care of this. And it does, like, an evil smile. Yes, I, I, we. I even in our chat, I kind of threw it up there that like the Hakuman scene was the same thing, and that moment's so great because like it destroys an entire island of Japan, and then like like one person who's watching it is like the bastard smiling. It's, <laughs> it's having fun, <laughs> and like it, it's like it's a great it's a character establishing moment because it is really funny. It, it's it's funny in a kind of fucked up way. <laughs> Just that, like, Fujita kind of goes out of his way to just show how com- kind of, like, cartoonishly evil it is. But when you look at the illustration, it is terrifying. Yeah, that's what, the one thing Fujita is really good at. He's really good at making these, like, villains that feel very over-the-top and absurd, but they're just really entertaining and kind of compelling at times. Yes, yes. I, I will say that, like, even right now in Sobote you know, baby spoiler, but like the final battles in art off right now, <laughs> like it's two of the characters drawing in a competition. It's not fist to cuffs. It's drawing. And I'm really interested in seeing how that's going to work out. But I mean, another story thing is that, um, Rin realizes when she's talking to Kevin, that actually the government is interested in using Minerva as a weapon. Like they brought them under the pretense of saying they're going to destroy it, but then she figures out, wait a second, no, you're talking. The whole time you've been on the phone talking to somebody, obviously that you, you know, reporting something to somebody. It's actually somebody higher up that wants them to use Minerva as a weapon, which that's very Fujita too. <laughs> like he fits all of his yeah. twists and everything like that. This isn't like diluted, uh, uh, the diluted version of Fujita because it's only one volume. He still gets everything that you'd expect from a Fujita series in one that one volume it's like if you gave fujita a giant jug of coffee told him to <laughs> chug it and then make a one volume manga <laughs> that's what this manga is yeah i mean like because like uh even like the ship crashing into japan at the beginning that had like minerva on it that gave me like very similar vibes to the beginning of Sobote, where you have the plane crashing into japan yeah, no. The more that the more that I'm looking through it now, yeah, I agree with you, Lord. Not that I disagreed that this definitely feels like okay. This is what I want to do for Sobote because like a lot of the Sobote things are in here. Except, I guess Sobote leans more into the horror aspect of thing. I mean, not that this isn't a horror series, but yeah, like I, I was saying, yeah. that I'd say like during the battles, it kind of goes into the more horror aspect. Yeah, like yeah, for sure. Because, like, I, I know we were talking about this the other day that, like, one thing I do like about Fujita is, like, with all of his series, like, he does approach them slightly differently. So it's not like, okay, I'm just drawing another series the same way I would the rest of them, just with a different plot. Like, um, I noted in uh, Moonlight Act that he doesn't use as many, he still has a bunch of dual page spreads. It's Fujita. Those, like, drip out of him like sweat. <laughs> but, like, they're way less than like Sopote and a lot of the art's a little bit more straightforward, like his approach to paneling and everything like that. And I mean, to be fair, uh, Moonlight Act is about, I mean, it's still a very Fujita premise, which is fairy tales come to life. And, you know, we have this guy that like basically beats them back into the story. <laughs> so like, and even with that, he makes that really interesting, but his artwork is definitely it's a way different and more straightforward approach than in Sobote where like it's a monster house eating people and aliens. And yeah, it's read Sobote somehow. <laughs> yeah. Please read Sobote. Sobote is like, I I'd say it's a masterpiece. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'd put Fujita up there with like Yoshitoki Oima and Noaki Urasawa as like some of the best mangaka that is still releasing manga, like ongoing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that one. Like at this point, Sobote would really have to like shit the bed for me to be able to, for me to say that it isn't like one of the best manga I've ever read. Yeah, and like with Fujita's track record, I can't yeah. imagine him. No, I mean even shitting the bed. Yeah, I can't. I can't either. Like, there's no way I can imagine. Sobote just completely ru- ruining itself by its conclusion. Like I'm looking at this one page with this jet just flying through the air and it looks amazing and for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like even here with like Wicked Eyes, like I thought like okay, maybe this ending's going to be like very abrupt or anything, but nah, it works. Like they spend a good amount of time on that final bout with Minerva and satisfying too cuz like everyone ends up working together like I feel like all the, like, five, like, main characters all have, like, their own kind of involvement. Or I guess four, because it was counting Minerva for some reason. But the four main human characters all have some sort of important thing they do. Yeah. Like, I really love the part where, like, Mike decides to become Yuhei's dog. (laughs) Yes, yes, I remember (laughs) that part. Like, he's like, yeah, I'm going to need me. Like, what's great about Mike is, of course, he starts off you know, the series being like really vocal about why we even need this old man. You know, he's really, really impatient with him, but then Yuhei saves his life. And then that's when he starts saying, okay, he he comes around and he's like, then he's like really supportive and everything like that. In fact, I mean, he's the guy that's like telling the story at the end, I think. Yeah, he is. And like, you can tell like, uh, Yuhei respects Mike pretty early on just because of like the little thing he does, like by standing up for Yuhei, in front of the other sharpshooters, like, because they were making fun of, like, oh, Yuhei uses this super old gun. It must be useless. But Mike's kind of has a stance, like, that he got from his father. Like, nah, everyone's personal gun is important to them. It all has value. Yeah. And, like, you can see, like, that rapport building from there. And it's, like, really cool to see. Yeah. Like, uh, and that's really what Fujita's very good at, is those, like, little character moments that would be easier to kind of glance over and just kind of go for momentum and say, yeah, that's not important. But that's what makes a for, uh, most of Fujita's characters feel fully actualized is that they have these little moments where um, they're interacting and maybe it doesn't really. I mean, yeah, it's something at the time, if you're reading this weekly or monthly or whatever, it may look like, oh, that why would he spend time on this thing? And then it pays off later. Which is why, as much as it feels like Fujita could, I mean, he did do one series with Kodansha, but I really feel like his home is Sunday because the pacing in Sunday um, or Shogakukan magazines does allow for that kind of like interaction instead of focusing on the forward momentum and like getting to the main point of the plot. The characters don't feel like they're just there to advance the plot. They feel like organic parts of the story. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, I think. Fujita probably could even survive in, like, an environment like Shueisha because he has, like, the prowess to, like, do action scenes right off the bat. But because he has a more proclivity uh, proclivity to build up his stories gradually and then kind of go deeper into the weeds, I think that is for the better for him, usually. Yeah, I think Wheeler hit it on the mark. Because the thing about... um that whole like building rapport between characters and being able to like give those moments of like the the characters growing organically that's what actually makes the that's it builds the tension and it makes the actual uh like action scenes the way that they unravel like that much more satisfying because not only is like the craftsmanship for the action scenes like super engaging but even during like interpersonal moments you get uh like good like facial expressions good like just like body language like the way that all the characters like interact with each other like it 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 works on a on a very like synergistic way like yeah yeah no i agree and like I, i know i kind of um glazed over it earlier but like yeah the whole thing with rin and yuhei like they're i should throw in that they're not related by blood but um like Kevin's the one that kind of explained to her what gets her to kind of come around to is what Kevin explains that after um, Chieko, you know, his wife dies, like he continues, he continued to fight Minerva by himself. And 
he even lost his eyesight, you know, fighting this fighting this owl. And at one point it shows one point they're like wheeling him to the hospital. And the only thing he's saying is, you know, Chiako's name. And then that's when like Ren realizes that this whole time, you know, he's been like this surly old man fighting this fight by himself. But it's not like he doesn't care about, you know, her mom. It's. He does. It's just he's and this is like another thing with um, Fujito works is like they have they have those that those deaths that you don't see. You see both in and out of the action. And I feel like that's important. Like and then that's how Rin realizes, OK, this is my father. He's not just he's been fighting this thing all by himself. And now I want to help him. Yeah, I mean, it's like. It's a really nice character moment. And. You'd think in a short series like this, like, Fujita wouldn't be capable of that, but he finds it through these, like, very good little moments that end up having payoff in the grander scheme, which I think is just a testament to his, like, abilities as a storyteller. Um, The fact that he's, like, been so used to doing these, like, 30-plus volume stories and then can, like, jump into this and still have the same consistent quality. Yeah, I, I was still, you know, going going back to Kodansha, I was surprised he was able to do um, a series in two volumes that felt just as satisfying as a 40-volume series like Karakuri or 30 with uh, Yushu and Tora, and this one's only one. Yeah. Why don't we have more Fujita in English, guys? Yeah. That's the question. Like, I could see... It. I At first, I admit, when when you first suggested this for the show... I was just kind of like, oh, this must be super old because I've never heard of this. But then finding out it's it was just 2007, it's just like this would be a great entry point for to get people interested in Fujita. Like besides, um, uh, I forgot the name of the series. <laughs> what was the, the one that he did for Kondansha? Uh, Girl on the Shore. Black Black, Black Museum, Museum goes to the Black I, Museum. What the fuck am I thinking about? <laughs> At least you put something out there. I didn't even need to put out there. But yeah, um, the uh, Ghost and Lady, like that was, I guess that one just got lucky in the fact that it was Kodansha. That's the only real reason why it made it out here. But I would think that something like this, a one volume story, you could even say, you know, by the Ghost and Lady author. And that would get at least turn some heads to be like, oh, maybe we should check this out. Like, I guess I can kind of understand not wanting to put in the time for something like Ushio Otoro or Karakuri Circus, since they're so super long. But yeah, it's weird that we don't have more Fujita. Yeah, I think the barrier has been the fact that, like, all the series are pretty long. And I have a feeling, even though we love Fujita, I don't think enough people know about him or care enough to buy his work in the U.S. Yeah. True. I, I would love to know how Ghost and Lady did. I have a feeling not very well. Yeah, that, that hurts me. Because I, I don't really think Kodansha promoted it much either. Which is a shame, because they could have been the gateway for us to get this. Yeah, and I think even in, like, say, other countries, like, I think in France, they've been doing Moonlight Act. And from what I can tell, Moonlight Act doesn't sell that great in France either. It didn't. It's like his... I, I hate to say worst, but it's his lowest selling series in Japan, too. Yeah, so, like, that's probably part of it. Like, Ushu and Tora would probably be the best thing to release over here if they were to release anything in the U.S. Yeah. Or Sobote, because of recency. Yeah, I was wondering, but, or V-Lord Bias, but no. <laughs> <laughs> or V-Lord Bias, yeah. So, but, no, I mean, I, I understand why it's a tough sell, though. I just wish someone would take the risk. But yeah. it's also a big risk because, like, you don't want to release the series and for it to not even break even. Yeah, that's true. I mean, at this point, it's seeming like Sobote just released its 24th volume this month. So, and Fujito has been pretty much very loudly saying that it's going to end soon. So it has a chance of being a sh- well, no. Well, if it ends before, because I think Moonlight Act was like, what, 27 volumes? 26, 27 volumes. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, 26, 27 volumes. So it probably. 29. 29. Okay, so it still has a pretty decent chance of being like his shortest series. 
well, besides, you know, Ghost and Lady, but well, okay, well, and this. Wow, I can just keep self correcting, don't I? <laughs> the shortest main <laughs> There work. you go, yes. Like, yeah, shortest main work or, or show, the shortest work in Shonen Sunday. So, that works. Yeah, so yeah, like. 29 is still 29 volumes. <laughs> <laughs> but I also kind of feel like, well, knowing just knowing the current events in Sobote, I, I can't see it going more than like another or two. So, I mean, they even Shogaku Khan recently released like I think volumes twenty one through twenty four over successive months, which got a lot of people thinking, "Oh, I guess it's about to end," and it didn't. So, yeah, but definitely yeah. from this work, I can say Fujita has still got. I mean, he's always got it. I I think at this point, as long as he's drawing manga, he'll have it. Fujita is just like a god. He really is. Everything he touches turns to manga gold and pools of blood. <laughs> Beautiful pools of blood. And he, and he doesn't, and this is all stuff he does without, like, because right, I remember Mon Ben, like, uh, Urasawa just visiting in his office and like, wait, you just, you just draw it without, like, you don't have a plan. You just draw on the page. <laughs> like, and which is just like, wait, that's not how everyone does it. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned like all like the iconic assistants that worked oh on yeah us yeah I, I actually yeah i totally forgot about that thanks for bringing that up v lord yes we had nobuyuki onsai uh, hold on i have to find the ooh. yeah nobuyuki onsai uh hiroshi fukuda and uh kazuro inoue okay here we go uh, kazuo kazuro inoue um Ansai and Fukuda and Masahito Soda. So, um, Fukuda, Hiroshi Fukuda is the artist for Mushi Bugio and the world five minutes later. Um, and I do know that Fujita is the reason why Fukuda even came to Sunday. Like, he probably could have been with any magazine he wanted to be, but like, he specifically chose, uh, Sunday for Fujita and Aoyama. He wanted to be there. He got to be he yeah. got to be Fujita's assistant, but I don't think he ever got around to being Aoyama's. But yeah, um, you can definitely see the influence um, in Fujita's art style in uh, Fukuda, though, because like Mushi Bugyo definitely gives off Fujita vibes. It does. It, it has those crazy like in your face panels and like the pages are like wild and vivid and. Yeah, Mushi Bugyo is definitely a product of somebody who adores Fujita. Um, Nobuyuki Anzai really doesn't need too much introduction. He's the Flame of Rekka, Mar, Mayor, Flame of Rekka, Mayor, um, and he's currently doing a series of Sunday, The Beautiful World of Orisagawa. So that's interesting that he was an assistant on this. And Kazuro, Kazuro Inoue did Midori Days. Um. Oh, nice. That was he's done. He's been with Sunday for a bit, but Midori Days is probably the series most people know him for because that got an anime. Um. Yeah. I, he, I don't. <laughs> Does anybody want to talk about the premise of that series? Or <laughs> there's a guy, and his hand is a cute girl. <laughs> I remember when I first heard about that series, and I'm like, "Yo, what the fuck? What the heck is this?" <laughs> yes, yes, like literally, his his people may have that whole euphemism about you having a right handed girlfriend, and yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, took that to extreme. <laughs> so, I mean, but yeah, I got an anime and everything by Studio Perot, so or Perot, so clearly somebody thought it was. Great. I, I haven't read the series or watched the anime, and clearly I need to fix that. And, what, Midori Days? Yeah, Midori Days. I I never actually watched it, but I just the the premise just tickles me, <laughs> and um, I know that the anime was directed by Tsuneo Kobayashi, and I really like this. Okay, so clearly we need to have an episode about that. Yeah, he directed yeah. um. Shires. He re- he directed the the anime for uh, Emma, Torian Romance. Oh, 
And oh, yeah, yeah. he also uh, did the Glass Mask anime. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. uh, he his last, I think, directorial work was the the last Naruto the movie. Oh, wow. That's quite the pedigree. Um, oh, yeah, he that... did the uh, Twelve Kingdoms. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, Kobayashi has, like, he's he's got a lot of shit under his belt. He's good. Okay. Um, and not to leave out the last author I mentioned, Masahiro Soda. Who uh he's mostly known for Capeta, which was in magazine. Um, but yep. Um, but he also did uh Firefire Daigo of Fire Company M, which was also in Sunday. Which is uh also known for being one of the worst selling manga in English in the US. <laughs> <laughs> you know we're gonna talk about it, so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, apparently, like, it's a genuinely great manga. There's a very good piece by uh, Jason Thompson on Anime News Network, back when he was doing the House of a Thousand Manga column about it. And, like, it definitely seems like a very interesting series. It just, like, didn't really uh, jazz up any interest with English audiences due to a combination of, like, lack of good promotion and uh just it not being a very interesting thing i guess people didn't want to read about firefighters listen though i mean the art looks really damn it good. does it, which is interesting in the fact that like there's actually a sequel and it's in monthly shonen magazine um mm, yeah I've, I've heard about i that. actually heard about it from fukuchi like fukuchi seems to be like my pulse for news because like he drew fan art of it um, but yeah, that's how I heard of it. And yeah, it's interesting that it's in Kodansha instead of Sunday, but right. Yeah. Cause it's not like he hadn't done other series with Shogaku Khan after that. Cause one of his recent series was the 10th prism, uh, the 10th prism. I cannot pronounce this <laughs> today. Um, and that was a big comic experience and that was actually even licensed by, uh, cork and crunchy roll huh. and like was simul pubbed huh interesting and yeah i mean he did another series in magazine recently well not recently but it ended in 2019 change so he's kind of been all over the place like he started a champion went to sunday stayed with shogaku Khan for a while then went to magazine yeah did big comic so yeah it's like, interesting that he took it there rather than just you know like guess on or something but well that is what it is so i'm looking i'm quickly looking something up about firefighter well um okay yeah so i looked up jason thompson's article on firefighter and said some of the later volumes sold fewer than 100 copies oh dear (laughs) yeah that's i kind of wonder if that's what made like viz start getting a little more (laughs) wary about sunday stuff that isn't just takahashi Although that's yeah, and surprisingly, they still released the entire thing due to an obligation with Shogaku Khan. Yeah, Sh- Shoggy <laughs> intends to get their money. <laughs> yeah, and they still actually have it fully available digitally. So if you really do want to read it, you can, which is nice. And I'd probably suggest doing that sooner rather than later because I feel like that license is going to expire at some point. Yeah, and I don't see it getting picked up. I mean, if Cheeky Angel could just be let go, then it's time. I, I feel like at this point, yeah. maybe it's maybe a good idea for all of us to get it because we're, we're gonna have to talk about it <laughs> so yeah and uh i've checked those physical volumes are absurdly expensive gonna be digital for me then <laughs> oh um just something interesting is that he uh soda used to be a formal assistant to motoyuki tanaka who draws b blues oh nice so yeah and tanaka's currently b blues is doing super well and well i wouldn't say super well but it's doing quite nicely in Shonen Sunday for something that doesn't have an anime inexplicably. <laughs> but um but yeah, that that's so the Sunday family stays together. I'd like to hope that it's doing well considering it's like over 40 volumes at this point. At this point, like considering the fact that Sunday had no new serials for like a year, <laughs> I would be surprised if some things are just sort of there because they need to fill space. I'm sorry, Maxi. Like, oh, okay. I'm sorry, Maxi, but thank you. Thank you. Chest. Thank you, no hot. just never gonna leave. No, like 
Switch is ending before Daiku no Hato, and, and that to me is baffling. <laughs> but whatever. Someone at Sunday Editorial just really loves it. Or they're singing Maxi by all the volumes, <laughs> and they're like, oh, that one guy in the UK is like really into this. So let's uh, do it for them. Let's make their day happier. If it gets an anime, I hope Maxi's credited. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you see the opening, it's like original work by um, Michi Teru Kusaba and like funded by Maxi to be. No, not even that. There's a giant banner of Maxi in the opening. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, uh that is I mean this was a fun series. I mean, I can't even call it a series, but it was a fun work to read and I'm definitely looking forward to digging more into more Fujita as as we do future episodes and I mean, Feelord's tweet, I retweeted it and it got a whole lot of attention. So there are Fujita fans out there or people that at least think like his artwork looks cool, which it does. It, it does, yeah. Because it is. Because I remember my Sobel tape thread got like a lot, a lot of people looking into it and asking, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> uh, like the, this is the thing with Fujita. I think if people gave his work a chance, they would love it. It's just that first part that's really hard because oh, you're wait. not gonna get the average person to look up Fujita. I feel yeah, it's- unless you like throw it in their face. Just, just take a and just be like, "Oops, I dropped my entire." Co- like 42 volumes of Karakuri Circus on your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like if someone licensed, say, Sobo Day or any Fujita work and gave it like a very good promotional campaign, I think it would do well. Because once you get into the hands of the people with an audience that will listen to what they say, it'll probably start like moving some copies. I'm just not sure if anyone would be willing to do that or invest the money in that. And even then, like, what would the profit margins on that be? And that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> yeah. At least someday. All we can do is just keep, you know, keep recording Saturday Night Soggy and hopefully somebody's listening and be like, hmm. Because, I mean, that's how essentially the Karakuri Circus and Ushio and Tora anime got made. It's just some fanboy was just like in a position of power was just like, I want this to happen. It's happening. Speaking of, I would kill to see like Studio Volan or someone make a movie of Wicked Eyes. Yo, yeah, I would be like, if this had the rights. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. If like somebody were to just like, if we had the same staff of actually, I I think Karakuri was directed by the same person that did Ushio and Tora. Yeah, it was Nishimura. Okay. So yeah, we just had the same staff as those two just do the movie for this it would be amazing like i'd be so down for that yeah like i am totally down for the eventual moonlight act anime but i'd also not be opposed to that taking longer and us getting wicked eyes first yeah no i I, i'm completely with you on that one like i kind of wonder at this point uh, and i have to look it up but um, the time, the gap, the length of time between the Ushio and Tora and then Karakuri Circus anime it wasn't like a year or two, something like that, I believe. And then to the internet, <laughs> like so, Ushio and Tora ended. The anime ended June 2016. Yeah, and the anime and for then, Karakuri started in October 2018. Yeah, so about. Two years. So we're we're about due for that announcement for Light Act, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if again it wasn't like Fujita's. I mean, I like I, I think as a work it's great, but apparently not many other people felt the same way. <laughs> so we just skip the Soba Day yeah. then. No one no one loses there. <laughs> Soba Day is always exactly. Looking. I mean, it's still it's still doing pretty well for itself. So yeah, we could just skip the Soba Day and. Just animate that. I mean, maybe they'll just announce it when the final volume is out. Pull a chainsaw, man. God, if that happens, I'll be so happy. Yes. I don't care if it's going to be like 36 episodes or something. It'll still be amazing. Yeah, because I, I feel like Sobote, especially, and without going too into it, could do a Sobote episode. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I feel like Sobote, especially, could 
benefit from that kind of um even if they were to like cut some things here or there i feel i still feel like sobote would do well because it, it's pacing lends itself well to that uh, in reading through ushio and tora i finally read the manga well i read the manga from where from a certain part in the i was watching the anime i read the manga from like i want to say slightly before the final arc like the maybe the last 10 volumes and like it, it was still pretty much the same experience. They they definitely cut out like a few things here or there that didn't really affect the story much. So do you Did you read the arc that like was entirely skipped in the I anime? I did not. That one I do want to go back and read at some point. The parts I read were just like pretty much corresponded with the anime, except for maybe like they explained a few things that the anime didn't kind of glossed over for the sake of time. But yeah, I would like to read that one arc that just got completely cut. But I, I feel like Ushio and Tora, though, it didn't really... It wasn't that negatively Im- impacted by being a little bit more streamlined. Karakuri Circus, on the other hand, oof. Yeah, I mean, I feel with Karakuri Circus, you had an issue of, like, for one... It had a shorter episode count than even Ushio and Tora for a manga that is longer than Ushio and Tora. And also, there's a lot more moving parts in Karakuri Circus, while Ushio and Tora has a bit more of breathing room where you like, you could cut some fat, and while that fat is still beneficial and adds like some flavor, you don't really need it, while there's a lot less fat in Karakuri Circus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm i completely agreed in that. I mean, reading both, yeah, there's just a whole lot going on in Karakuri, and there's no wonder it's as long as it is, because there's just... And I mean, I guess that's just being Fujita, the fact that he is just very character-driven, because, like, there's several different... Fa- not only are there several different factions, but each faction has, like, its own backstory and its own, like, a faction within a faction. <laughs> And like, yeah, it, it gets pretty 43 volumes. It's not it's not surprising at all. It needed all of those volumes. There there really isn't so far from what I've read in Karakuri Circus. There really hasn't been like a time where it's like, man, we really didn't need this. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think like we'll probably cover every Fujita series at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Or at least all the Shogak- Shogakukan ones, though. I do recommend Black Museum. Black Museum is very good. It is. It's just not Shogakukan. It is. <laughs> well, I mean, in probably every other subsequent Fujito episode, we're probably going to at least bring it up once or twice. So that'll tell you how good it is. <laughs> exactly. But all right. I. <clears throat> Does anybody else have anything to say? I mean, I wish I could contribute a lot more, but I'm just really not as versed in Fujita. Uh, but like... Hearing you guys talk about it, I'm I'm well aware of how much I really need to just bite the bullet and get into it. Um, Marion, we will infect you with the Fujita agenda. <laughs> Have you heard the good word of Sobote? I just just read Sobote. Like like I I I would want you to read all of them, but if you were just like I can't I can't commit to that, which is completely understandable. Read Sobote because like that is almost and you know how hard it is for me to be like i think that this thing is the best thing i i don't like that phrase but i think i can say it for sobote there's nothing wrong with that series sobote will literally sell you in one chapter <laughs> that's all it takes it really t- one chapter like, i literally don't doubt you i'm going to i'm going to deep dive into all of Fujita stuff eventually i think um uh, I was really like burned by the Karakuri Circus anime, so I was like, you know what? Next time I read like this guy's stuff, I'm actually gonna read Karakuri just because. And then like, uh, there, I remember in Puzzle and Dragons there was a uh, Sunday collab, and uh, they actually added uh, that girl from the the Karakuri Circus. Wait, oh, the one with like, I think so. Shirogane. She has like the the skin type bodysuit. Yeah, Shirogane. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that's a cool design. Yeah, I gotta read this shit. I mean, she's Hayashi Bara. Come on. Oh, yeah, she is. So you have to. And then, like, I liked it that with the uh, the um, Fujita anime, they have those central cast characters, like um, Rikia Koyama is Tora and Narumi. 
and Megumi Hashiabara's Hakume no Mono and Shirogane. Yeah, I was about to say, wasn't that also Hakume? Yes. Damn. So they they've been. So I'm almost. I I would be really surprised if like either Sobote or Moonlight Act gets picked up like for an anime that they won't try to retain them again. It would be Ricky in uh, Sobote. Ricky Okoyama. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. I don't know, actually. Like, I, I think maybe I could, I could see him being Doctor August. Yeah, I could see I, that. I could see him being that, and then like Megumi, I could see her either being like, um, uh, damn, Kuranai. Uh, no, no, maybe not Kuranai. I don't know. I think she could fit Kuranai. I would feel. I would think that she'd be better as a uh, Kai Kairi Kuro or. Uh, uh, I forgot her actual name, but like, yeah, I can see her doing her or Yadogiri. Okay, mm-hmm. that's yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I would either say Kai or Yadogiri, or you could even have um Ricky as uh, I love that name. <laughs> you could even have Ricky as Zanka. Zanka, I can see him pulling that off. Okay, I'm committing all of these names to memory. So Sunday announce a Sobote anime already, so all our dreams can come true, they, and I can die happy. <laughs> and clearly, we're gonna have a Saturday night. We're, if they do get an anime, and it's not like on Netflix, um, we're gonna definitely have a corner on Saturday night Shaggy where we discuss each week's episode. <laughs> the so would be like a monthly Sobote corner, I guess. Oh shit! I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking of all our. We have too many podcasts. So- <laughs> we're gonna replace every podcast with just a sobo take for it. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> it's just have oversoul where we just like, okay, we're, we're done talking about all that other shit. Let's talk about sobo day. It's gonna be like, um, remember, uh, will it blend on YouTube? Will it destroy? That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh Spoilers, it does not destroy easily <laughs> or blend. <laughs> Even Fujita's gone on record and joking a few times. I thought I would. I remember like um one of the you know uh, the Sunday TOC commentary. Like they ask a question of the artist, and all the artists are they answer it. I would say required, but a lot of the time they kind of just don't answer. <laughs> but um like I feel like the one for like the New Year's for this year was just like what's something that you thought you'd do last year but you didn't, and Fujita was just, like, I thought I destroyed the Silbo tape, but. <laughs> That's good. For a second, I thought you were gonna say more volumes, guys. I swear. <laughs> or what, Marion? For a second, I thought you were gonna say uh, that the magazine asked every other author, uh, "Do you think Sobote will be destroyed this week, or or this month, or this year, or whatever?" <laughs> I mean, he did say it to another artist that their series has ended, or been ended for a while. That he and them were talking at a party and they were both just kind of saying my series in at first no mine no mine no mine <laughs> and you to lost that bet <laughs> god i think i know how neko gucci would answer it <laughs> <laughs> <Be> Lord, <no. laughs> he'd say he'd destroy it with ass <laughs> he would he wouldn't even say that he'd just be like fujito sensei can i ask you a question <laughs> Have we ever mentioned the ass thing on the podcast? No, okay, so um so along with Fukuda, like Neko Gucci, who draws uh, uh Amano Megumi Suki uh, Amano Megumi Wasuki Darake um by Neko Gucci, he's also was an assistant to um Fujita. And Fujita being the guy he is, he asked his assistants, why do you get into drawing manga? Um and Neko Gucci just was like, I like drawing asses. And Fuji Show is just like, why the fuck? Uh, why the fuck are you here? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I embellish a little, but like more or less, like in the Wikipedia. Like of all the mangaka, though, you would not expect Neko Gucci to have been an assistant to Fujita, who has more dead bodies in his manga than fan service. Yeah, like, that's the one thing you can say. And when Fujita does fan service, I mean, I'm not going to say you're saying it's tasteful, but it's never, like, meant to be, like, titillating. Yeah, whenever there's nudity in his work, it's very rare that it's meant to be sexual. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, like, Sobote's 
one of the few manga aside from anything Takahashi's run that had like actual nipples in it. <laughs> so, but again, it wasn't meant to be like sexual. It was um, Kuranai. She's like a maiden, like a Miko sort of battle Miko. <laughs> And, you know, she was purifying herself in the falls. And, you know, obviously she's doing that with nothing on. So. Yeah, that was like chapter seven or something. It was really early. Really early in the series. I mean, later on in the. I'm not going to say anything else. We will talk about Solitaire when the time comes. (laughs) Soon. Maybe. (laughs) TM. Yes. But that's all I have to say. Anything. You guys have that? Fujita Blast. Yes. Uh, All hail our savior. Yeah, I think we've uh, exhausted our our Fujita for the night. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to go- getting back at this topic again. But uh, I think it's time to round out and uh, end the episode. Uh, Vlord, where can people find you? Yes, people can find me on Twitter at VlordGTZ. I also write various manga and light novel reviews for all comicom and also Tanami-related articles for TanamiFaithful.com. So you can check out both of those places. Um, And then I do quite a few podcasts besides this one. A good chunk of them are with also Marianne Sakaki. So our big one is the Demon Slayer podcast on Twitter at DSlayer podcast. But then there's also Oversoul Shaman King podcast on Twitter at Shaman King pod. And then I do a podcast that is more of a general anime and manga one called the Dumb Weebs Podcast on Twitter at Dumb Weebs Pod. And then I occasionally pop up on the Toonami Faithful Podcast on Twitter at Toonami Podcast. So you can check out all of those places to see what I'm up to. You don't have a a personal Twitter? I mentioned that at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> just, just making sure. <laughs> Why don't you give them your personal Twitter, Sakaki? No. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I'm at Kirofon, K I I R B O N. Um, uh, there's nothing there. Uh, th- besides that, I also write for Tsunami Faithful and really should get back to work doing things for that. Uh, and I'm on another podcast with the, our good friend Colton, another DB pod, another day, another adventure where we hope if it's animated and it has Goku in it, we're hoping to talk about it. Unless it's like some random McDonald's Japanese, Japanese McDonald's commercial. Do not ask us about those. Um, Eventually. <laughs> but the biggest thing I do is at, is weekly Shogaku Con edition at WSS Talkback on Twitter and WSS Talkback.blogspot.com where we talk about all things Shogakukan. We try to, anyway. I have a major focus on Sunday, Sunday, but I'm trying to branch out to other things. Actually, all the Japanese news that I said on today's episode, you can it's probably been there. In fact, no, I sourced myself. I'm at that level now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and if anybody's interested in ever writing or doing anything for Shokakukan related, you want to write an article? We actually had a guest article for Michael Sun's anime. So we're definitely willing to work with people who just want love Shokakukan, Shonen Sunday, and want to write stuff about it. In fact, we have a lot of help from somebody who's hosting this show who's written things for us. And they're it's definitely not me. <laughs> Gee, I wonder who it would be. <laughs> And their articles are amazing. I, I have to say that. Like, Oh, I, yeah, it's definitely not me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you shut up. <laughs> Your articles are amazing. <laughs> You're beautiful. You should feel beautiful. <laughs> but yes. Though, Everyone go love Marion. Exactly. Marion is a blessing. Yes. All right. They make everything better. You can, mm-hmm. you can love me on Twitter at Microwavy, the eat before the beep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love Mary in 2021. God. New hashtag. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a card there. It has all my projects. Uh, like people said, I do, I do write for the WSS blog, uh, the WSS talkback.blogspot.com. I'm working on something. Uh, hopefully, it should be up by the time this episode is also up. Uh, maybe, probably, hopefully, it should be. Um, 
yeah, it's just it's been kind of hard writing uh, since like the beginning of the year because you know pandemic shit. I work at a pharmacy; it's hectic. But uh, no, we're we're get, we're going we're getting through it together. Like it's always. I mean, you're doing important work. You're helping people get vaccinated. Yeah. Um, it always helps uh, podcasting with you guys. Uh, like Velor said, uh, I'm also on a Demon Slayer podcast, the Shaman King podcast. Um, I also co-host the Good Friends Anime Club, uh, Haiku Pod. Sometimes I guess for MHA Pod. I'm, I'm, I'm many places. Uh, like I said, you can find all that all that stuff on the card. And I also write uh, editorials for Tsunami Faithful at TsunamiFaithful.com. I just finished writing one up on Bobo. Uh, I think by the time this episode's up, the, the editorial should be up as well. So check that out for sure. And I also have personal reviews. on. I, I write reviews on my personal blog, which is heavensdoorknob.wordpress.com. And uh, yeah, you can find uh, Saturday Night Shoggy at Sat Night Shoggy on Twitter. And we're also hosted on Anchor and everywhere else that podcasts are found. So definitely, uh, if you like this episode, give us a follow, subscribe, hit the RSS feed, whatever, you know, uh, and stay tuned for more because we, we try to do this monthly and there's always something to talk about. So, yeah. Uh, with that said, Chagan wa gachiri ni tobu Wicked Eye Flies to the Moon. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of something. Hold, calm down. Uh, <laughs> Scuba Doo, jump to the moon. There we go. <laughs> what the fuck? Dude, wait, wait, is that? Oh my god. I know where that's from, but. God. Okay. Enlighten my Zoomer I, I don't. Who's good? Yes, I. God, how could I not know this? <laughs> Just get shoggy with everybody. <laughs> yeah, get get shoggy with that. You guys, ugh, come on! I I tried very hard. It took me a good two minutes to come up with that. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, let me stop recording. <laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs>